So I'm delighted that you're here. Thanks for coming. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Of course, I'm mindful. The reason I'm seeing this chair is because of uh, Dr. Coburn is not here, so he's in our thoughts and prayers. And sure, sure uh, want to thank you. Want to thank our witnesses. And looking forward to the testimony. Uh, when it comes to this issue, the, the questions I'm going to be uh, looking to have answered is, first and foremost, since I've been here, been looking into this issue, uh, we're really declaring uh, federal disaster uh, declarations on a more, much more frequent basis. Now, is that because we really have, you know, a higher instance of, of the types of uh, disasters that require that, or are we just too quick to declare those, those disasters? Uh, I'm afraid that if we have an over-reliance on, on the federal government help, is that restraining the mitigation? I've, the new word I'm hearing, resilience, in, in terms of you know, how we prepare. Uh, are we being penny-wise and pound-foolish by not uh, spending the money up front to mitigate? And is, again, is it over-reliance on federal help when these disasters hit? Everybody's expecting the federal government to come in and pay for things, as opposed to actually mitigating these, these uh, risk ahead of time. And so from my standpoint, coming from the private sector, I certainly understand that the, the pr a private insurance market really is very, provides very strong discipline in terms of mitigating risk. You know, whether it's fire risk in a, in a, in a plant, uh, you basically insurers come in there and say, listen, if you, if you put in sprinkler heads every six feet apart versus every 24, 24 feet apart, uh, you're going to be able to mitigate that risk and you're going to be able to lower your insurance price. So I, I really have the experience that the private sector insurance market is a very good discipline to those uh, risk mitigation efforts. And I goes, you know, those are the kind of questions I'm asking in terms of how, how can we uh, certainly utilize the federal government in the most efficient way because, you know, like you said, Mr. Chairman, uh, we don't have the money to do all these things. So, again, look forward to the testimony. You know, I'm a big fan of a fellow named Bjorn Lombard, who with, you know, basically issues his report, I think it's called the Copenhagen Project, and I, bl I believe he's an adherent of, of, of uh, climate change, but he's also uh, pretty good at prioritizing with limited resources where we should be spending our dollars. So I think my first set of questions really goes toward that prioritization. You know, how do we do that? Uh, and are we doing it effectively, and, and, and can we be, for example, killing two birds with one stone. Uh, I'll start with you, uh, Ms. Durkovich. You, you talked about cybersecurity, um, which brings to mind power grids, which brings to mind the, the uh, attack at the Metcalf transmission station in, I believe, San Jose, San Jose California. Um, you know, there are a number of things that, that could affect our infrastructure. You know, obviously natural disasters, weather disasters, as well as uh, you know, man-made terrorist attacks as well. Are, are we trying to combine these and, and take a look at that from the standpoint of prioritization of, of trying to mitigate uh, uh, problems? Uh, our role within the Office of Infrastructure Protection is to help owners and operators understand the range of threats and hazards uh, they face. Uh, and as they look across their enterprise to manage risk, to provide them with information, uh, with tools, uh, with best practices, uh, so they can be um, both efficient and effective in application of um, how they, they go about managing these risks. Part of the reason that we have moved um, to a more all-hazards focus uh, within the Department of Homeland Security and across the, um, uh, across the Homeland Security enterprise is that we find as you work to adapt uh, preventive measures and mitigative measures uh, to um, a range of, of threats and hazards. They are, also, they are applicable um, uh, not only to just one particular hazard, but to many, to many hazards. Uh, and so we work very closely with the owner and operator community to think through this. But let me um, touch briefly, for example, on the substation um, issue. So as we think about um, security, but also um, incorporate uh, climate change and extreme weather into that conversation, as owners and operators are looking to invest um, in upgrades and to modernize that infrastructure. Um, as they make improvements related to security, um, we can also um, have conversations with them about whether 
these assets and these facilities are in flood prone areas, are in areas that are susceptible um, to sea rise. So as they start to make um, the multi-million dollar investments that you're seeing, again, to enhance their security and resilience, we're thinking about these things uh, in parallel and in integrated fashion and ensuring that the, the money that is um, invested in these um, uh, enhancements and these mitigation measures is um, used effectively. Um, but again, our role is, is really to help them understand the range of threats and risks uh, and to consider um, measures and options that allow uh, an efficient and effective application of resources. Mr. Heyman, in terms of prioritization, are, are there lists being prepared? I mean, we, we talk about it, we talk about prioritization, but is there any product that's actually ever produced? Uh, there is. Uh, so the, if, you, if the, the national preparedness system has about five parts to it, one is to identify the risks that are available, two is to get a, 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 a sense of where the gaps are, looking at communities uh, based upon what capabilities are required for preparedness, then to do the resources assessment and, and ultimately resourcing, followed by training and exercising, and you do that cycle again. Uh, at the end of that uh, uh, exercise, uh, the, there is a list of capabilities that are prioritized uh, for communities, for states. Those states then apply for grants to FEMA uh, based upon those, that gap analysis, uh, and that becomes the basis for the next year's preparedness uh, planning and evaluation. Um, and so that's a regular cycle that's, that, that's, uh, that's done. We had a, the National Preparedness uh, Report as an annual report, uh, and, it, and, and it, uh, it was uh, re last released was last, uh, last year. Um, let me just talk a, bit, a little bit about prioritization as a, as a concept, because I think that uh, you, everyone has said that mitigation is critically important, and I think that's right. Uh, the, uh, there was a study done a, a few years ago by the uh, Multi-Hazard Mitigation Council which said a dollar's worth of investment up front and mitigation led you on the back end to four, four dollars uh, back in your uh, in your in terms of return on your investment and and similarly at the Louisiana State University Hurricane Center uh, evaluated what kind of benefit mitigation would have done in, in Katrina and they, they came back with a figure of eight billion dollars would have been saved so how do we do that uh, one way of doing that because the federal government doesn't own and operate most of the infrastructure and it doesn't own, an opera, own the residential housing or the buildings that are out there, is to try to incentivize uh, and encourage uh, raising standards uh, as it pertains to uh, the built environment. And uh, the program I mentioned, Resilient Star, which we're piloting in the residential environment this year, um, provides uh, a basis for trying to look at how we can do that on a broader scale across the infrastructure so that uh, people are, are, are motivated and incentivized either through self-preservation because their, their, their house will be the one standing or through um, other incentives, whether it's uh, 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 mortgage reductions or perhaps uh, uh, premium reductions in insurance. Um, and so we're looking at that, and I think that's something that's, that, that this nation should, should take a serious look at. Well, let's talk, because you're using the word I wanted to get to next, is incentivize. Where do those incentives best, where, where, where it best come from? Or where, where do they best come from? Uh, private insurance market where you've got uh, basically millions of different decisions being made or from, from cent some centralized uh, entity like the federal government trying to uh, do it with a, a one-size-fits-all approach. So there's, there's a number of different actors in this, in this world. Uh, you know, when you go to buy a house, uh, they're the builders. Are they going to build it to Code Plus standards? How do you get them uh, in, engaged in that? One of the, in our, as we're getting going ahead with a with a pilot, what we're seeing is that a lot of builders are interested in this for the uh, b because uh, they see a market advantage, and so there's a, a, a benefit to to being labeled, for example, resilient star. There are the uh, it, the insurance industry is interested in this because uh, it saves them a, a whole lot of money on the back end. Uh, with uh, possible claims for damage, you, you know, if you're looking at the life cycle of a house every 40 years, 
and uh, and residential owners maybe may, may see a benefit well, because well, of, let me just stop though wouldn't, wouldn't the insurance industry itself have a vested interest to develop these standards and wouldn't they if they develop them themselves in the private sector wouldn't it be more effective than than a government run solution so the so in so insurers have looked at this in fact we are partnering uh, uh, with uh, the insurance industry uh, to try to develop this pilot uh, project um, and uh, for um, I think for various reasons possibly because there's so many different fraction fraction uh, so you have a fractured insurance market you have a number of different state players and all. I think that one of the benefits that the federal government can bring is a national perspective, which is much, uh, which is which is not something any individual insurance company can do. Can I just ask one more question? I don't, because I have a great deal of concern. If the federal government is the 800-pound gorilla, and everybody in the private sector is looking, or at state level or local levels, looking for the federal government to bail them out, is that a real disincentive? to do the, the resiliency, do the mitigation efforts. If, if, well, you know, if we have a big flood, if we have a big hurricane, the Fed's going to be coming in there and cover our losses, and then some. I mean, to, to what extent is that, uh, are, are we witnessing that uh, really throughout the country? Well, you're, 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 you're not, unfortunately, witnessing that. Uh, in, in many places, you have communities that are devastated, that people have packed up their bags and left, and you're losing your tax base. You're losing your ability to in, uh, attract individuals to come to your community. And, uh, and uh, the federal government can't help in, in that regard when people move with their feet. So uh, this is one of those uh, issues that I think local governments or urban communities uh, will probably take a, a good look at because it, if you're a resilient community sitting next to in a, in a zone which has a risk, uh, people may want to be there because in the, in the long run you're safer, more secure, and frankly the funds that you would have to pay in rebuilding your community can be paid to other priorities like public safety and education. Of course, that's the point, isn't it, that we need to r raise the price for individuals that are building in very risky environments. Correct. I mean, that's, we, we, we don't want to continue to incentivize people to, to be building in areas that we know are going to flood every year or get wiped out every 10 years. And, and, and that's why it's important to have the, the best available data so that people actually are cognizant of where they're building or living or moving to. Uh, we, uh, we, FEMA has tried to get that uh, 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 as a basis for, for getting data out. And then, frankly, when we work with communities to do their uh, threat and hazard uh, uh, identification risk assessment, um, that's all, you know, wide, with, your, with your eyes wide open, looking at what the highest risks are, and then asking if there's a way that we can partner together to, to reduce those risks. Okay, thank you. Uh, Ms. Patton, I'd like to start with you. You mentioned a growing resilience gap. Uh, how, how much of that gap, you know, especially the growth of it, would you attribute to the fact that we've just continued to build in very risky areas in this country? Um, I'm not in a position to uh, here identify the percentage or a precise number, but it, it's substantial. We simply have more um, assets in harm's way. We have a, a history, and there's a lot of um, uh, data and research which indicates that we have a migration to coasts. We have a migration to locations which have limited water supplies. We have um, a migration to the WUI, the, the wilderness urban interface. Under all of those circumstances, you put more assets in harm's way. So the suggestion is that at least that's a portion of the driver, but we also have other uh, suggestions that the climate is changing. There's no question. No, no when, when society subsidizes private individuals taking those types of risks, that, that increases that type of behavior, correct? Um, and there is research, which I have cited, cited in my written testimony, which does uh, demonstrate that. In fact, um, if there is an interference with risk-based price signals um, and a subsidy which basically um, provides information to uh, an individual that this moving to this location isn't that cheap and if there's a disaster it will be uh, subsidized, then yes. Well, we, we have that interference, correct? Uh, we do. And that, that would be, what, what would cause that interference from your standpoint? Um, well, there are a multitude of things. Some of it are actual funding and some of it's perceptive. So in the case of actual funding, there are programs which come in and provide subsidies in, for um, government-run insurance programs. There are also circumstances where there are perceptions, and there was a, a study done um, uh, by a, a, a federal task force uh, at the con after Sandy, which was trying to look into what people understood about their insurance and what that 
um, study revealed was that people really didn't understand what was insured and what was underinsured. And their assumption was that federal disaster funds would be delivered kind of like insurance. Th they, they, were, they were correct, weren't they? <laughs> well, the reality is, in fact, um, the priorities for federal disaster funding is to is to really look at getting critical infrastructure up mm -hmm. and started, um, but not necessarily always focused on an individual asset, which is the purview of private insurance. And they are not a 100% substitute. And I have cited um, research in my written testimony that affirms that, that uh, demonstrates that, in fact, disaster recovery funds are not economically, don't have the same economic value um, that you have from private insurance and that you ha can have longer term um, negative macroeconomic impacts if you are underinsured versus um, having adequate insurance. I mean, it, it does, as, as necessary as federal help is in, in, those, in those circumstances, it creates more high hazard, doesn't it? Um, it is very clear that under circumstances, the federal government must respond um, under mm -hmm. disaster. It's a political imperative. It's a, right. but it's a, it's a social imperative. Um, but, but how you manage and structure that is very important. And as some of the other co-panelists have suggested, there are ways to prioritize that spending. And there are ways to structure programs in terms of providing information and risk-based price signals that are consistent. Um, there have been recommendations that have been made by the Wharton School uh, as, how, as to how some of that risk-based price signals might be adjusted in a way for certain um, federal insurance programs. Uh, there are other suggestions that exist in terms of prioritizing inf um, infrastructure investment so that resilience is you, baked into the design. Do you think people would build million, $2 million homes right on the beach if they had to pay the full cost of, of the risk on their insurance? I don't think I'm in a position to know that. <laughs> is, is, you, know, you come from the insurance business. Is it a fantasy to think that we could, over time, Prior or privatize the, the flood insurance program? Um, I think that that will be a question that I will have to return to you on in terms of, of responding in full. I would tell you that I think it is very important for us to send consistent risk-based price signals in this context and let the market work. And that is not happening right now with the, the National Flood Insurance Program, correct? Um, there are changes to that flood insurance program. Which, which we are. suspended which are designed to, to allow that. Okay, yes. and again, that's, that's not a good thing in terms of reduction of that moral hazard. Yeah, the position of, of Zurich of, is. And of, of you know, really creating that incentive for risk management and risk mitigation and, and resiliency creation, correct? Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. It's very important that the risk-based price signal and the insurance functionality be, permit, be permitted to make sure that risks can be assessed the asset owners can be fully informed about what not only the actual functional risk is, but what the cost of that risk is, so that they can make cogent decisions about how they invest, not only where they invest, but when they put structures together, how much they invest. Okay, now, we're, we're talking about private individuals, private property, but at the same time, government has property, which they also purchase insurance for, correct? Um, well, there is something called the self-insurance rule uh, under government, and there are, depends on whether you're talking about local, state, or federal government. Um, and uh, in general, the federal government is a, primarily a self-insurer. Uh, and when does, it does, that reduce, does that reduce their incentive to mitigate risk? That's in, their in your money. opinion? I mean, if, if they were forced to buy insurance, not self-insure, would, would they potentially, because within their budgets, if they're, if they're building and, and not mitigating risk, would that help mitigate risk? Um, the only thing I can point you to is that there is a, a, a long-standing Comptroller General opi General's opinion, which dates back to the 1700s, which indicates that um, the federal government is supposed to be a self-insurer by rule. Uh, and um, there are policy uh, reasons for that. But the functionality of private insurance, um, you are absolutely correct, is to send a risk-based price signal to encourage people to mitigate risks so that they can control those costs over time. Well, as you said in your testimony, the insurance industry has a unique capacity to dis provide that discipline. So uh, either, either of you two gentlemen want to comment on, on that line of questioning? Um, I think I would just add that I mean, the, the problem that we're seeing can continually is that folks will see themselves as libertarians until they need help because they haven't taken care of the private markets. And so, you know, we are we are trying to figure out ways, you know, in Delaware, particularly in, in one of our counties where they don't have some of the more more pr protective policies in place to not have state government in this case be the backstop because they're not getting private insurance and you don't have the policies in place. And then they're coming to, you know, us and saying, well, you fix this drainage issue, this, you know, this erosion issue. Um, so trying to realign those incentives is the same issue whether you're local or, or national. Okay. 
Dr. Kirshen? Um, I'm not an expert on insurance, but I know if like water rates go up, people start to conserve. So I think it's very important we send the right market signals for um, climate change preparedness as well. Uh, and I also want to say that um, I think you know the engineering and the science community and the social science community, I think we know how to do adaptation. And we need to send the right signals to the market to, be, to, to give us the opportunity to work with stakeholders to implement, implement adaptation. Okay, again, thank you all for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um,